began to deal with me almost immediately about the ministry. I didn't understand why, but in 1969, in the month of May, I announced my call to the ministry 50 years ago this month. And um, before the Lord, before I made that decision or came to that decision, I asked everybody I could find, how did you know that the Lord called you to preach? I asked that question. I don't know how many people I asked. I asked my dad that question. He said to me, he said, if you can't do anything else, And that's all he said. I didn't really catch on right at first. Well, I uh, want to thank the church for inviting me back. Don't know why, but you did. I don't know if it's just because I'm a kind of a nice guy or you feel sorry for me. <laughs> But thank you. Am I starting now? All right. <laughs> My assigned subject, attitude toward those who don't agree with the truth. Uh, he does me like this every year. Now, I, I thought... What in the world am I going to say? But I sit down in front of my keyboard and I begin to think. And The Lord gave me some things I hope is what uh, the pastor had in mind. I feel that that's what the Lord had in mind. But I want to go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 2. Just read a few verses there. Apostle Paul says to this young preacher, Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call upon the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord, that's the minister, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the Acknowledgement of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by his will. Your pastor always says that we should not come with an axe to grind, and that's, I agree with that a hundred percent. I certainly do not have any axes to grind this morning. And uh, I love my brethren. And um, I'm saddened that there are some absent which have been here in the past. So my subject, if we are talking about those who are non-Baptist and we can't agree on the doctrine of salvation, there's nothing, other, nothing else to talk about. No use talking doctrine to people who, you know, has not come to understand the doctrine of salvation. Because in order to have a discussion about Bible doctrine, there must be a common ground, and that common ground is Christ and His blood. So I'm assuming, therefore, that this assignment has to do with those who are or claim to be or 
and those who are or are claimed to be our kind of Baptist. A few years ago, a movement began by certain individuals who were teaching that it is not necessary for a church to be started or organized by the authority of another church. That uh, has, that heresy, and I call it a heresy, has died down somewhat, but it's not dead. But that hurt hundreds of churches over this country. And I believe that the, I hope that the men, some of them are passed on away now. And I believe that they know the truth now. But um, some of those churches never recovered. Now those of us who have not changed over the years are being shunned somewhat by some of our sister churches for our stand on church truth, head covering King James Version, and even the style of preaching that we preach. I asked a simple question. What in the world is going on? What is happening? I don't believe that Any of the people that's involved in this went into this with the idea, well, I'm going to change things. But the devil is so subtle in his work. Things happen so gradually that you can't even know that changes are coming through. But let's talk about truth for just a moment. I've got some comments and then we'll discuss our... Um, our text. What's the best way to define truth? You define it in one, four words. The Word of God. The Word of God. Not only is the Word of God the truth, it is the absolute and undisputable uh, truth. The Word of God is the only source of truth. If there's any truth in the world, it's from God's Word. And the final authority over all matters pertaining to man and to God. Pilate asked the Lord Jesus there in John 18, what is truth? Men may interpret truth interpret truth in terms of personal belief or bias or feelings or prejudices. Truth can be interpreted by men in many different ways. These traits can be bent and curved and adjusted and fit to whatever our own doctrinal bias is. Still the truth is the truth, no matter what I may believe about it or not believe. This one thing you must remember. Two people may disagree on a certain thing and both be wrong. But you can't both be right. Someone has said, by dying for a conviction, a man proves only that he is sincere, not that he's right. There are those, even some who claim to be in the ranks of sovereign grace, once agreed with others of us, but now have come to believe something new and different. Something has happened. Either they were once right, believing that what they held was the truth, or 
they have been wrong all along until now, and having received some new light, discovered that the truth that they once believed was not really the truth, and now they have found the truth. Which would also mean that all of us who hold the things believed to the, be the truth for hundreds of years have been wrong all along. Have I changed in the last 50 years? Yes, I have in some things. I've grown, and still growing, by the way. But there are things that I have not changed in. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, there's one thing about growing, coming to, uh, new, to understand things, but not discovering new things. Now, I must be clear on this one thing. If a Baptist, if Baptists do not have the truth, no one else has. And I do not say that in arrogance. I say that because the Lord Jesus teaches us this. The Lord gave us the truth to his, he gave the truth to his church for which he died. He promised that he would lead his church into all truth. Did he not? John 16. How be it, verse 13, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you, who? His church. Into all truth. I want to look at a few issues that's come to my attention. And again, I, I, uh, I am not trying to, uh, trying to, I'm not trying to make any enemies, that's for sure. I love all my brethren, and I pray for them. Let's examine a few of these issues. First, the manner in which we are to preach. Now, expository preaching is a great way to preach. Expository preaching is used, it's a method that I use some, from time to time, but not always. It's certainly a great method for a busy pastor who has to preach three to four times a week, who doesn't have the time working, perhaps, doesn't have the time to develop a topic four times a week, a brand new topic. Today I happen to pre be preaching a combination, you might say, of a topical message. My last point will be more of an expository or so. The truth is it has always been that there are several different methods whereby we can present God's Word. And I'm sure that this pastor uses, probably uses them all from time to time. Expository, topical, contextual, character studies. These are all good methods. Now, uh, the Lord Jesus seldom preached expository. Uh, Peter, on the other hand, on the day of Pentecost, did somewhat preach expository. Uh, Paul, actually, uh, we only have very few sermons recorded by the Apostle Paul. Uh, and most of those involved his personal testimony. Now, I'm not sure if he ever preached an expository message as it's defined today. Except maybe in the letters that he wrote, Romans, Galatians, and uh, Hebrews. I uh, have read many, many sermons of Charles Spurgeon. He preached a few expository messages. Uh, 
but not all of Spurgeon's sermons were expository. Many of us, many of you, <laughs> I must say, are preach uh, uh, messages, develop your outlines with uh, alliteration. I love it, but I'm not very good at it. So you, you very seldom hear me preach a message with alliteration, that is, rhyming of the, the, the topics, topic, head topic and subtopic. Spending too much time on these things, so I'll try to move on. Secondly, the Bible, uh, the Bible, that should be used to preach and teach. If a man comes to believe that the King James Version of the Bible is no longer adequate to preach from, he must believe that he has, uh, he and all of us have been wrong for the past 500 years. Some argue that it is, has errors. I disagree. And my just plain old common reasoning. If it has errors, where are they? And if you, if you think you know them all, maybe you don't know all the errors, if they're there. I happen not to believe that there are. I believe that the Word of God is inerrant. And I, I happen to believe that God did not leave it up to men to get it right, that He preserved His Word. Thirdly, the matter of a woman's head covering. Through history, there have been a few who oppose the covering for one reason or another. However, hundreds, even thousands of God's men have interpreted 1 Corinthians 11 to mean that a man uncovered brought honor to God in the assembly because he represents the authority of Christ and that the woman covering her head brought honor to God because she it was a sign of the church's subjection to Christ. It is, a, it is as dishonoring for a man to wear a covering in the assembly as it is for a woman not to wear a covering in the assembly. And those who sneer at and scoff at those of us who teach and preach and practice the head covering, how many of them will let their men members come into the church wearing ball caps and cowboy hats? Well, The question is, have all the Baptist preachers and teachers for all the last 2,000 years been wrong? And how is it that if the contrary is true, why is it only now suddenly being discovered by some sovereign grace preachers? Brother Matthew Stepp wrote a historical piece very thorough historical piece on the woman's covering. You can go online and find that. It is one of the best works I've ever read on the subject. He went all the way back as far as history would carry him uh, on the subject, and I, I, would, I would recommend it to anyone. Fourth thing is, we've seen uh, the precious doctrine of the local visible church come into question. I'm going to tell you if you if you begun if you start following reformers, these very articulate, very educated, very wise reformers, teaching some of the wonderful things of the doctrines of grace. You follow them far enough and you're going, to follow, you're going to follow them down the wrong path. Now, uh, there are men who write and teach the doctrines of grace. I admire what they teach about that. But they're as wrong as they can be on the doctrine of the church. Amen. You follow those men far enough, you're going to follow them right down the wrong path. And you're going to end up in the reform uh, camp. I've seen it happen. 
over the years that I've been in the ministry. The doctrine of the Lord's church has been attacked over and over throughout history. The devil despises the Lord's church. He despises it. That attack comes, has its roots. I don't care who is teaching it today. It has its roots in the Roman Catholic Church and her daughters, the Reformers. The doctrine of baptism has been the source of more persecution down through history than any other doctrine. The devil hates the Lord's church and Baptists are the only ones who have been willing to defend the truth from all of the wiles of the devil. If it's pride or arrogance to believe that a Baptist church is the only true church, you take that up with the Lord and the apostles and the historians who report to us and the millions who have died for her cause. Fifthly, are numbers important? I don't know of a preacher, never met a preacher that didn't want to preach to a lot of people. I do. Uh, if I had the opportunity to preach at the um, Brave Stadium, I'd love that. I'd, I'd do that. But if God places me in a small rural church community, rural community, to preach to a group of ten... I'll preach to them as if I was at the Brave Stadium. Because that's God's flock. They deserve it. Many or uh, most of the Apostle Paul's preaching was uh, to small groups. But he did preach to larger groups as well. And uh, if, he, if he preached to larger groups, he most usually ended up being run out of town because the groups he preached to were those who were uh, hostile to him. But listen, folks. Many, if not most, of the Lord's churches do not, down through history, have been small, some only families, many in houses and rooms. Do large numbers matter? Well, here's what matters. Am I willing to do what and be where God would place me? Compromise will bring crowds, but if you pay people to come to church, you're going to have to pay them to stay because the world is never satisfied. All right. Our attitude. What should be our attitude toward those who do not agree with the truth? I speak nothing out of malice or anger or hatred only out of frustration and sadness. I do not expect to agree with everyone to agree with me on everything. And I don't expect, I, I don't, probably don't agree with any of you on everything on certain matters. But I do not, I don't, I don't uh, make an issue out of things that are uh, I, want, I hesitate to say less important because all the word of God and the doctrines are important. But there's some things that can be made an issue and should be. So uh, I'm able to fellowship with, I have brethren that I work, that I work with. We have, we have um, 
uh, prayer every morning. We pray for the students every morning together. Those men are, some, one of them is a Methodist, and uh, others are, are Baptists, and most of them are just uh, Armenian Baptists. But I believe these men know Christ. They have a testimony of Christ. And we fellowship on that basis. So uh, I don't expect all my brethren to agree with me on everything. Uh, you know, uh, marriage and divorce, end time prophecy, missions, and even church truth are a few things that I differ, differ with on brethren that I've known throughout my ministry uh, in, a, in, in my time. But there are certain things that we can disagree on and still fellowship, and certain things we may disagree on and not fellowship. I say we cannot fellowship in a church capacity if one cannot agree on church truth, on church authority. Even though they're, they're, they may be a lovely brother and I love them in the Lord. Um, I say that uh, uh, the Lord's Supper is another where you have to draw a line. If you profane the Lord's Supper, then you are in error. And uh, 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 to not to to have the Lord's Supper, if you if my wife bakes a pan of biscuits and we drink wine with them biscuits, we've profaned the supper. If we have unleavened bread and profane the supper with grape juice, we have profaned the supper. And that makes it difficult to fellowship on a church capacity, not on a personal basis with brethren. Again, this, thing, this one thing we must understand, two people can agree, disagree on, one, on another, one thing and both be wrong, but we can't both be right. Truth cannot oppose itself. It doesn't, you can't split truth in two different directions. Truth is absolute. It is what it is. However, though some have gone astray, at least in attitude and some in practice, they're still brethren. And we're still required to love them and to be patient with them and to pray for them Let's look at this passage right quick. We've got two or three minutes here. He says in verse 22, a very important thing for all ministers and Christians in general to know, follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with all, with them that call on the name of the Lord without a, out of a pure heart, in other words, those who are sincerely professing Christ. I really don't think Paul meant peace at any cost or at all cost because there are things that we must draw a line. In other words, uh, we are to love them as brethren. Verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle. Unto all men, apt to teach, patient, patient, patient. The word strive means those who engage in war, the war of words, basically. Quarreling, wrangling, all these things, disputing. This is not, this, this is not healthy. You can't jump on someone with anger or with slanderous words and expect to win them uh, uh, in a discussion. When entering into a discussion or debate, deliberation, we must exercise a spirit of gentleness and meekness. You know, it's, not one, it's one thing to argue with someone 
And usually arguing arguments bring anger. But when you can sit down with a brother in love and discuss a matter and deliberate a matter with different views in love, usually there's something is accomplished. I'm going to uh, skip over this next one because I'm out of time here. I've got about a half a minute. And I want to look at, uh, just mention this again, reiterate my conclusion here. Truth matters. We cannot compromise the truth. And if you believe the truth, then it's the truth. And uh, truth doesn't change. There cannot be two truths on, an, on any issue. If you think that you've discovered something that no one else knew about until now, if it's the truth, you just somehow missed it over the, over the years and uh, you have now discovered it. I've, <laughs> I've missed things over the years and discovered the truth. But I have not ever discovered anything new. If it is something that is contrary to what has been taught in the Bible, you can be sure it's of the devil. God is not revealing new things today. And I warn you young preachers, don't spend your time trying to find something that no one else ever discovered. You're going to, lead, you're going to go down a path that's going to lead you to trouble. What should be my attitude toward those who do not believe the truth? Certainly not hatred and not malice. Be a brother. Loving, kind, long-suffering, but not compromising for the sake of friendship or fellowship. Thank you, brother.